Thank you. We have a call to order the meeting of the City Council Planning Commission of April 9th, 2024. Can we have a roll call? Commissioner Fields? Present. Commissioner Majewski? Commissioner Ostrowski? Present. Commissioner Craig? Here. Commissioner Buckminder? Present. Vice Chair Kamkar? Present. Chair Susan? Here. Okay, my name is Alan Zisser. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, approval of the minutes uh, of uh, March 12th. Has is is, is everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Are there any corrections? Commissioners? Nothing? We have a motion. Of approval of the March 12th uh, Planning Commission minutes. A second? Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a vote? Mm -hmm. Before you vote? Commissioner Fields? Aye. Commissioner Strasky? Aye. Commissioner Craig? Aye. Commissioner Buckbinder? Aye. Commissioner Kepper? Aye. Commissioner Sisson? Aye. Uh, Director Eastwood, do you have any communications, agenda modifications, or postponements to notify us of? Mr. Sisson, no agenda modifications or postponements. Uh, we did receive some information with from Commissioner Hamcar to speak to the ad hoc subcommittee. Uh, you'll receive that, and of course, that'll be uh, referred to during this presentation, but nothing additional. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I will open uh, uh, for all requests. This is a point in our meeting where any member of the public may address the commission on an item that is not on the agenda. You may speak up to five minutes, but the planning commission may not take any action today. Is there anyone who would like to speak either in the chamber or online? On a, on a non agenda item. Nobody have mine? Okay. Well, I'll close that portion. And uh, we'll move on to meeting. Uh, before we start with our regular agenda items, I want, I want to provide some information on how we will be conducting the meeting for each item. Uh, for each item, I'll first introduce the item and ask for a staff presentation, after which the commissioners may have some questions for staff. After that, we will open the public hearing and first ask the applicant uh, to speak if it's applicable, if they're here, followed by any other members of the public. We will first have any public speakers physically present speak and then anyone attending via Zoom. Members of the Planning Commission may have questions for the applicant or any of the public speakers once we've received all public testimony. We will close the public hearing and the Commission will then have discussion and a motion and decision based on the nature of the item. Before we start on the items, commissioners, do you have any disclosures regarding the items on the agenda tonight? Um, I have walked, I've walked around and through and by the uh, site for the precept um, for item uh, M3. For item three. What's on? The, the one, it's behind the Del Broadway project. I've walked past like almost by it on my way here every time. So I I visited the site. Okay. I visited Doctor. Mr. Gather. No. Visited the second site. Sure, Strasky. Okay, I visited uh, the Grace Avenue site and I happened to bump into one of the owners and had a Brief conversation with her, introduced myself, and uh, we had a very nice conversation. Um, she actually asked me if they should, they should be here tonight. I told them it's totally their option uh, to attend if they want. Um, and that's the only thing I have. Okay, so first item. Uh, PLN 2024-20, uh, uh, 1796 Grace Avenue, public hearing to consider the request. Public hearing to consider the request of Raman Zuhor on behalf of Tillman Weckel, Weckel to allow the construction of approximately 537 square foot second story addition to an existing single family residence 
with a reduction to the second story side yard setback from nine and a half feet to approximately five feet three inches. The application under consideration includes a site architectural review permit um, file PLN 2024 20. Staff is recommending that this project be deemed categorically exempt under CEQA. Planning Commission action is final unless appealed in writing to the city clerk within 10 calendar days. Project planner on this is Larissa Loman. Larissa. Thank you. The item before you is a site and architecture review permit to allow the construction of a second story addition with the setback to an existing dwelling. The project is positioned within a setback currently developed with an existing two story single family dwelling and generally surrounded by other single family dwellings. The proposal seeks to extend the existing second story through the construction of an addition as seen in the proposed elevations. The addition would continue the second story and extend over the existing garage. Uh, the city allows a second story addition with a reduced setback through the approval of a site and architecture review permit. In review of the application, the Planning Commission should review the project's attention to privacy, scale, mass, architectural design, and neighborhood integration. It is designed to match the existing building using the same materials for roofing, siding, and windows, and this approach ensures that it will fit the existing context of the Grace Avenue neighborhood. Uh, the addition is recessed from the first story and maintains the required front, rear, and street side setbacks in accordance with the Campbell Municipal Code. Uh, furthermore, uh, the placement of windows, uh, there are two uh, windows placed here uh, within, a, within the proposed bedroom. Uh, these are aimed at the part portion of the adjacent facade that does not contain any existing windows, uh, therefore minimizing any privacy concerns. Uh, furthermore, uh, on the adjacent facade where there is an existing window, uh, the proposed window on the proposed addition is a clerestory window. Uh, so that means that it is positioned six feet above the finished floor, uh, thus further minimizing any privacy concerns. And then finally, the addition is positioned towards the front half of the property, and therefore minimizing any potential uh, sight lines into the neighboring property's rear. Uh, for these reasons, the Site and Architectural Review Committee recommends that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution approving a Site and Architectural Review Permit, PLM 2024-20. I can now take any questions at this time. Okay, thank you, Larissa. Uh, why don't we start this time? Mr. Fields. Uh, I'm going to ask similar questions I asked at the meeting, just from everyone here. Uh, how many other homes in this neighborhood have sort of done this similar thing and had to go through this whole process? In the context of the Grace Avenue neighborhood, I didn't look at other properties that had uh, gone through a site and architecture review permit to have a second story addition. It wasn't very common. However, if you look in the neighborhood, many of the surrounding single family dwellings do maintain uh, second story uh, or two story uh, single family dwellings. And so for that reason, this proposed addition would mirror the uh, context of the surrounding. And so how did those homes have that and this home needs to go through this process? Good question. Um, and so the answer is maybe two part. Uh, this house needs to apply for a site and architecture review permit to allow for the reduction uh, inside setback. As you can see from the elevations, uh, the, where the proposed second story addition will be, there are a second story setback less than the re otherwise required nine and a half feet. And so this property would have been able to simply apply for a building permit if they were to maintain a nine uh, and a half foot setback to the second story. And then the other question is if there are existing properties within the neighborhood that do maintain this similar setback pattern, um, it is possible that they were built prior to the establishment of certain uh, residential development standards. Uh, this house was built, I believe, sometime in the early 60s. So, therefore, at that time, the city's development standards were different than they are today. Can I, can I ask something about this? Um, that neighborhood, which is like the fur furthest east neighborhood, like on the other side of Lee, has that always been part of Campbell? 
or was that somehow annexed? Or do we even know that? I could find that information and let you know. I don't have that uh, as part I'm of the report. I'm just wondering if we've had instances where that has happened in other parts of the city and that the homes were always built on a standard of San Jose or the county. So I was wondering if maybe that was the reason. But it's a possibility. A lot of portions of the city were annexed over time. Uh, we could consult with uh, some to determine exactly what they are. And my last question is sort of a broader one. Um, I know this this is somewhat unique to this neighborhood as it relates to the permitting. As we look at single family housing's objective standards, do we have any early thoughts on how we'd address setbacks more broadly? Like, like we're sort of making an exception in this case, and there's you know the rules as they apply to this neighborhood. I'm just curious, like more broadly. How, how might this fit in how we're looking at setbacks for single family homes? Um, so the approval of this permit process is through a site and architecture review permit, which is discretionary by nature. And to introduce objective standards, you would have to, um, uh, you would have to create uh, standards that allow this in certain instances. And I don't think that we're looking at doing that as part of our update, but if that's something we're interested in doing, then good. I'm just going to add, um, it's on the long-term work plan to look at single-family neighborhoods. There's a lot in front of it, yeah. so it's on point. Uh, additional note, you'll see a rash of these that we have up before. There's one coming, so I'm just getting these questions might be coming on. Why do we see projects of this type? Uh, so I'd, I'd say noted, and you know, to that part of the work plan, look at some efficiency measures. They had an uh, opinion they could put in record and so we could bring it to the planning commission, but streamline the process rather than go directly to the planning commission would be the technique to, to minimize having to have your answer. That that's, that answered my question. Thank you. So, any setback that's requested beyond the city standards is required to go through the same process, or is it? Uh, so, there's two processes. Uh, you could seek a variance, which a variance would be an exception to a development standard. Uh, that would be a process that would be heard before the Planning Commission. Um, this is a unique instance that is written into the Campbell Municipal Code that allows for second story additions that are seeking a reduction in, in, in side, interior side setback to be heard before the Planning Commission. So if they wanted to further they'd reduce, um, if they wanted to seek uh, a proposal like you see here that um, shows the second story side setback as being about five feet three inches which is what they're proposing as opposed to the nine and a half feet they would have to apply for a site picture for the second story and i guess if it was an adu that would not overcome would it still be adus have separate development standards that uh, maintain outside of the single family uh, residential development standards use um, if the development standards are a little bit more massive. Mr. Buffett. Yeah, let's take on what uh, Commissioner Field said uh, about what we should be thoughtful about if we're getting a lot of discretionary questions that all seem to be well, us rubber stamping something or passing through that we should see about bumping the be down level, especially if it depends. Oh, we're going to see what development applications are going to prepare. Questions on the Nothing to ask. Let's go sit down with that. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to ask the same question I, I, I asked just in our last meeting, and I, I guess it's still foggy in my mind. And, was, and you were the staff person that the other item was the exact same item. So if the neighbor next door did object to the placement of the windows, if it was a privacy issue, if they really were 
be close to each other. And, and they said, man, this is really bad. Then what happens? What what do we do? What's what's our would the staff would the staff recommendation be the same after talking to both neighbors saying, well, you know, we just can't get over this. It's just going to be an issue. But I think we can still improve it. Or, you know, what would it be? In theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have this one size fits all answer to that specific okay. question. Right. It's evaluated on a case by case basis uh, to the extent of what are the privacy concerns, how can they be mitigated, what does the uh, what does the proposal look like, what do the existing conditions look like. So, unfortunately, I don't have a one uh, size fits all answer. Um, in, um, you know, if staff could always work with the applicant with uh, in adjoining property owners to find out what the core issue is. And they would do that. Mitigation process. Okay, I'm going to ask you just one more, one more time, just uh, Commissioner Ostrowski's question, and I wasn't quite sure. Again, maybe there's no bad answer, but for any deviation of any of our standards, it is a, is a review before the Planning Commission required? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, through a variance, which or, or through, but it's still the same. We'll need to define things for variants that are different than the site architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, uh, I also need clarification. So, I understood that there were two methods. One was variants. But if that code was not written, if this procedure was not written in our code, then there would have been only one way it would be the variants. In this case, because it is written in your code that you could reduce the site setback, and there's that second avenue that this project is using. That's correct. That's, That's my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I just have, uh, it's kind of a housekeeping thing. Uh, uh, two things. Um, uh, just for my edification, maybe other commissioners, um, the process for informing neighbors, um, uh, is there a radius, like 300 feet or something? Yeah, 300 feet is correct. Okay. And, 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 and a notification is done how? Uh, so there's a couple different ways. So at project intake, there is something called a courtesy notice, which is sent out to a 300 foot radius to property owners on the most part, which describes the project in its next stage. So there might be potential revisions where the proposal may evolve over time, but that just shows the initial proposal. Uh, at time of public hearing, so for this planning commission meeting, there was another uh, 300 foot notice sent. Uh, because the plans did not change, it was the same depiction on the postcard. And in addition to that, um, the uh, item was noticed um, publication as well. And, and and there's no process for, like, for the immediate neighbor to get a confirmation that they received the notice and and they understood it, anything like that. So we don't we don't take another step that goes. Well, th this is the neighbor right here that has that would have the concern on this particular one. There's that you know, the fence. We don't do another extra step to say, well, maybe we should contact them, make sure they got the notice and understand. That's correct. We send out those notices about the extent. Yeah. So we just assume that they, they get it. And, Take actions they will. Okay. Uh, and the only other thing is, is you know, I actually look at the drawings. So, uh, AO2, the drawing AO2, I don't know if you could find that one. I, I'm not quite sure what page it's on. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a drawing of the layout. Is that it? Okay, so uh, at the bottom left corner, it says that, uh, can you blow that up a little bit? Yes. Is it able to? Okay, so. Okay. 
this this looks like the second story layout, right? All the bedrooms, right? But it says at the bottom that it's the main level. Is that just an error? Yes, and that's something that was actually uh, brought to my attention from the building official um, is when he was conducting his review. Uh, and so as uh, as discussed with the applicant, he prepared a separate exhibit that had the second story level, although at that point we decided it wasn't too important to include as part of this. But yes, this is a donation of the second story. It confused me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I was thinking, uh, they're going to make all the bottom level bedrooms now. It's like, but there's nothing in there. It's, uh, and then I, I came to the realization that was just probably an error in the identification. It's noted further in the staff report, post changes to first story and to the second story as well, which just be an extension with an addition of a uh, new floor area with uh, minimal changes to the interior. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. Okay. That's all I have. You have one more question, Mr. Gant, I think. Mr. Chairman. Um, so the when you said you sent the notice, we're, I'm assuming this is with U.S. mail. You mailed the notice. It is not an email. Oh, it's postcard. Correct. It is a, uh, a physical mail notice. And then um, the second question is, it doesn't matter whether that 300 foot passes the jurisdiction's boundary, meaning if it goes into San Jose or Moscato, so it's still, they still get a copy of the postcard, right? Even if they're not Campbell residents. Yes, yeah, so nothing in our code that distinguishes jurisdiction ones. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll move to uh, uh, any anyone, either the applicant or anybody else that has a question. I'll, I'll open it up. Uh, do we have anybody who wishes to speak? This is uh, the applicant or the architect here who would want to speak. Yes, no. Okay. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, we hi. This is this is Ramin. I'm the architect of the project. Thanks for having us and uh, reviewing our project. Um, uh, no comment. Obviously, I just wanted to make sure that I show myself and mention that I'm on the meeting. So we appreciate all the inputs and all the notes. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, okay. So I guess we'll we'll just uh, close that and move to. Um, Discussion by the commission. Why don't we start with Commissioner Buckley? Sure, sorry. I don't have any objections to this. Uh, I, I know that try and imagine that people complaining about privacy issues, but if we've sent out notices that we complained, I don't see an issue. And, um, and Yeah, no, I, I, there's no problem with this with this project. I think it's pretty straightforward. But I do think there were a couple. I did have a couple of thoughts, a couple of good ones, I think. Uh, and getting to Commissioner Zisser's question, and I actually do think it makes sense. In this case, we know that there's the one neighbor that would possibly have a problem. So can we confirm that that neighbor got the postcard? It doesn't seem like that's asking too much to avoid any kind of issue there. You know, we don't know if it's a renter, if it's the owner occupied, I guess. So, yeah, we sent it. Yeah, that's one thought. Yeah. No, no, we definitely sent one. But, you know, sometimes the postcard will get thrown out with the junk mail. You know, I don't know. It's just maybe going an extra step that's unnecessary. Uh, but it's a thought. And uh, it only came to my mind when Commissioner Cicero asked the question. And, uh, you know, on the bigger question, and I know that I think we've all been. Uh, United in this, that we're really all in favor of these objective standards and try to get away from discretion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in this case, you know, I, I think a ministerial review for, you know, for the design and the scale is something that you can count on. I mean, you know, our planning director or community development director can 
to do the job of a bigger entity like us. But I guess, you know, when you get to the privacy issues, sometimes they're a little more involved. And, and uh, I guess that's the idea is sometimes you want a, a bigger group to maybe take that, you know, these are kind of subjective decisions. So, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, 99% of the time, you know, it's pretty straightforward and quick review would be, would be fine not to make the homeowner go through the steps, but, you know, there's always those couple of issues and I think that's why they have these steps. And it, so I, I guess you gotta be a little careful on what you, you know, what you're gonna take away in terms of the review. So just a, just a thought in my mind, but this project, perfectly fine, no problems. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I also think it's pretty straightforward. I don't see a privacy issue, but um, I would make a recommendation. I'm also supportive of moving forward with the project. Yeah. Definitely supportive of the project, just to like enough of what Commissioner Cray said. Uh, I really wish this was ministerial and we find a way to do that when it gets there on the work plan. Because I feel like in this commission, ideally, we're talking about the hard stuff where there is an issue with subjective that we need to discuss and, you know, things like this. And there's, there's nothing that subjective, there's nothing that hard. And it, if it can be appealed so that we can talk about those, like that's what I'd prefer to use this time for, especially now being on the SARC and seeing so many of these, like they come to that, they wait two more weeks, they come to here. Sometimes they go to city council. It's just so much overhead for benign changes. So I really hope we, Clean this up as we can. Uh, okay, so my my only thought my only thought I mean I'm I'm in favor of this as well. We we just went we just did one a month or so ago in another neighborhood, and the neighborhood was dominantly had uh, had had the had the non setback on the second story and it seemed perfectly natural to uh, move this. I, I actually walked through the neighborhood a little bit. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a house uh, uh, not quite directly across the street that is a two story house that has no setback. Uh, there's a funny color. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then there, I, I, I kind of walked down the street and it was, I think I saw a couple other houses around the corners, but so it, it, it it's, um, there are other examples of it, not as much as the last one we looked at, um, but it, it seems that since the neighbor is not objecting and it, it, it seems a, a reasonable, um, that it, it, it looks fine. Um, you know, we actually discussed this last last time about whether we make the change and, and you know, uh, uh, Commissioner Fields uh, expressed his wanting to simplify it, uh, which did too. And, you know, my only my only caveat on that is that it's in the code that we, we have this as having second story setbacks. So that would need to change. The question would be whether we would need a universal change for the entire city or whether we would do it neighborhood by neighborhood, depending on, on the, the what the neighborhood is. You know, these particular neighborhoods, it fits in fine, but there may be neighborhoods where this hasn't been done and it's been more a uh, wedding cake kind of look, right? And so, so, you know, I, I think there needs to be, if we're, if, if it's going to be looked at, then it needs to be looked at it. Uh, if you change the code, what's the implications for the whole city and, and, uh, and, uh, whether or not it can be done in a way where there's rules for ministerial approval that would make would take into account um, objectively the different neighborhoods in terms of, of of whether or not this is a common common or not. So I'm just saying I, I think that the change would be something that needs to have some thought put into it uh, before we move ahead. But it certainly you know, we're going to have another one in another month. So just everybody remember <laughs> that we've talked about it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but otherwise, I, I'm I'm fine with this as well, and uh, uh, I think at this point uh, uh, we can have a motion, right? 
I'll, uh, I'm happy to move that the uh, Planning Commission of the City of Campbell approve a site and architectural review permit to allow the construction of approximately 534 square foot second story addition to an existing single family residence with a reduction to the second story side yard setback from nine and a half feet to about five feet three inches on property located at 1796 Grace Avenue, PLN 2024-20. Do we have a motion by Commissioner Cray? We have a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Fields. Take a vote. Commissioner Fields. Aye. Commissioner Strasky. Aye. Commissioner Clear. Aye. Commissioner Bookbinder. Aye. Western Chapter. Aye. Aye. Got you now, Philly. Okay. Act three, the agenda. But uh, so I, I need to introduce them. That's uh, this item is PLN 2023 12557 1 Avenue and 60 Dillon Avenue. Public hearing to consider the request of Richard E. on behalf of Robson Road Farms uh, LLC to allow the construction of a residential plan development, including 25 townhomes with 12 junior accessory dwelling units and one 10 unit apartment building, the creation of 26 private lots and seven common lots, total of 33 new lots with the use of a 35% density bonus and waivers from zoning code and East Campbell Avenue master plan and removal of five trees on property located at 57-101 Gilman Avenue and 60 Gilman Avenue. The application under consideration include a plan development permit, density bonus request, tentative subdivision map, and tree removal permit submitted under an SP330 preliminary application filed in compliance with government code 65941-1. Uh, mitigated negative declaration has been prepared for this project. Uh, tentative city council date is May 7th. Project planner is the Shani Sioni. Chad, it's all yours. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Sioni. I'm the lead planner for this project. We also have Richard Walker on Zoom from Interwest Consulting to answer any questions. This is the Ropes and Elms project, which consists of a plan development permit, density bonus request, tentative subdivision map, and permit permit. Uh, property located at 57 to 101 Kidman Avenue and 60 Dillon Avenue. The project site is a 1.452 gross acre assemblage of six parcels located southwest of the Dillman Avenue and East Campbell Avenue intersection. The entire site is zoned plan development. The 60 Dillon property has a land use designation of Central Commercial and is located in the East Campbell Avenue master plan. The remainder of the site has a land use designation of commercial and medium density residential and is located in the south of Campbell Avenue area plan. The site is developed with two vacant residential uses and a variety of commercial uses, all of which will be removed. Uh, before we get into the details of the project, and thing to note is that the applicant filed a preliminary application in March of 2023. This locked in zoning district designations and general plan policies in effect at the time, which has since been replaced. And the South of Campbell's uh, area plan has since been rescinded, but does apply to this project. That preliminary uh, application was reviewed on April 11th of 2023. Second thing to note is that the Housing Accountability Act limits the city's ability to deny a housing development project unless it's in violation of objective standards or it, it would adversely impact um, health and safety. 
Secondly, the PD zoning doesn't actually have any develop development standards that apply to the project, so the objective standards that I'm creating are fairly limited. An initial study and mitigated deck deck was prepared to evaluate the potential environmental impacts of this climate issues required for air quality, cultural resources, uh, geology and soils, hazardous materials, and noise impacts. Those mitigation measures have been included as conditions of approval. Additionally, on uh, November 21st, 2023, we received approval from the San Francisco Bay uh, Regional Water Quality Control District, uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board for a current conditions report and corrective action plan. This is for some issues found in soil and soil vapor. There are recommended actions for remediation and sampling of this soil. The applicant is required to go through this process as part of the mitigation uh, measures. The applicant is requesting a plan development permit with density bonus request to allow 25 townhomes, 12 JDUs, and 10 apartment units, a vesting tentative subdivision map, and a tree roof permit. This is the uh, site layout. You can see that the access to the site is provided by Gilman Avenue, two separate entrances and exits. There is no access provided from uh, Dillon Avenue. From the staff of Warren Bar, that's pedestrian access from Dillon Avenue. That pedestrian access is actually only meant for surface work. So maintenance crews, things like that, use that. But generally, pedestrian access will be off of Gilman Avenue. Each townhome will have two covered parking stalls. There will be a total of 65 stalls on the site. And because the site is located near high frequency transit and consistent with AB 2097, there is actually no parking that's required for this project. Additionally, the fire district has approved this design for the curb access on that larger entrance left side of the site plan. Um, the reason for this is that the fire district requires a minimum width entrance in order to meet their turning radius requirements, but the Public Works Department expressed concern that having too wide of an entrance would result in speeding in and out of the site of residents and visitors. So they've proposed a half curb. The majority of the curb will be nine inches tall, and then part of it will be four and a half inches tall. What that will do is uh, deter people from speeding in and out of the site, but will um, allow fire trucks to actually have a wide entrance to it. This is the elevation for the apartment building fronting Dillon Avenue. The building is 46 feet and 11 foot inches tall, which is about the standard and requires a waiver. The applicant is using a contemporary design with a variety of materials, elevations, and a cohesive color palette, primarily using stucco, composite shingles, painted siding, and metal accents. The townhomes will have two separate designs, but follow a similar design philosophy to the apartment building. Uh, one thing to note is that the applicant is still revising some of these designs. There will be some minor modifications, like we went through a staff level review. Lastly, the uh, density bonus for this project um, is a 35% density bonus to allow an additional 10 units. Um, they qualify for this with the inclusion of affordable housing units, two very low income apartment units, and one very low income and one moderate income town. Additionally, the applicant has applied for waivers from development standards that they um, are allowed to do under this density bonus application. The tree removal permit is required for the removal of five trees, four of which are protected. Three of these are considered fair uh, condition and the maintenance or uh, keeping of all three of these would render the project infeasible. The project was reviewed for consistency with general plan and land use plan consistency. It was found to be consistent with the general plan, East Camel uh, Avenue Master Plan, and South America Plan. One last thing to discuss in discussion with the applicant. They requested a few modifications to conditions. Condition 17 and 18 of Exhibit A um, are regarding the aerial access for both fire trucks. We won't just add a sentence here to state that aerial access is only required for Dillon Avenue and not for Kingman Avenue or for the private drive. Um, going off of that, Exhibit B, Condition 9.I, states that tree pruning be limited to, uh, limited to not prevent these trees from reaching their mature height. This standard does not apply to trees that need to be a minimum height, or sorry, a maximum height in order to allow that aerial access. So we'll add some clarification there. 
And lastly, condition 12.8 uh, is regarding ensuring that the occupants of the BMR units uh, meet income requirements who is responsible for that. It currently states that that's the applicant's responsibility. We will change that to say that it is the city's responsibility and um, applies to all below market rent units, not really for sale units. Thank you for bearing with me. I know that was a lot. Um, staff has met all necessary, found all necessary findings and met all necessary requirements, and it's recommended the Planning Commission adopt a resolution recommending that the City Council adopt a mitigated neck deck and approve all the rest of the documents. Thank you. Question. I understand that trees are going to be removed because the project is feasible. Are they replacing the trees somewhere else? Do you need the funding for trees or something? Uh, there will be landscaping on it. So both the streets um, and the interior back to those trees. Yep. They won't be like for like placements of trees. Was this already, uh, so this was already PD zoning, but they're requesting another uh, development permit to develop this particular project? Okay. So zoning um, is, the, is the same. And let me know if this is a question better suited for the applicant, but. Um, we got the preliminary hearing um, two days short of a year ago. What caused the delay? Oh, well, it's a long process of getting the actual um, final application. We had a revised project um, plan sometime in June or July. It's a significant fire and public works department to change some of the site. Um, and then address those issues. There was an environmental document that took a significant amount of time. Site in order to review meeting that we had to go to the planning commission and city council. So, combination of the process and budget changes. Okay, and that's just my question. Thank you. Mr. Craig. Yeah, I do have a number of questions here, and I, I know this is a, a good project that we talked about about a year ago. Uh, just on, on the CEQA part of it, I know you said the CEQA person was here, so I'll just ask that this. For any project, I suppose, but you know, we talk about these corrective actions that are going to be taken. So, who? Uh, I assume that the uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board and whoever would be the persons that would make sure that those corrective actions were taken are taken. But would you answer that? Would you do you mind chiming in? Yes, yeah, certainly. How do you do, Planning Commission Richard Walker, Principal Planner with the Interwest Group? Uh, pleased to meet you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the commission and the staff for a very well-written staff report. The correspondence with the Regional Water Quality Control Board staff that is responsible for the remediation has ultimately stated that there are volcanic organic compounds ultimately missed that uh, is evaporating from the soil beneath the um, the property to be developed. Uh, the case has ultimately been closed. However, there is a pending uh, mitigation measure as well as condition of approval that requires the applicant to file a request with the Regional Water Quality Control Board for a certification that uh, prior to construction, and we can confirm this with the mitigation monitoring and reporting program with respect to timing, of uh, mitigation. However, it is currently a mitigation measure and condition of approval that the applicant mm -hmm. secure a confirmation from the Regional Water Quality Control Board that the volcanic, uh, sorry, uh, organic compounds have been remediated prior to construction. As it is currently written in the hazards and hazardous materials chapter of the MND, there are clear instructions for the applicant how to secure this confirmation of remediation. And it is also a mitigation measure in the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. And as recommended by senior planner, Daniel Fama, it's also gonna be included as a condition of approval. At, at, at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is the property is safe for construction. However, this is a belt and suspenders effort to ensure that Regional Water Quality Control Board 
concerns with respect to remediation have been completed far prior to uh, grading permit and building permit issuance. Okay, pal, thank you. Thank you for that thorough answer there. Let's get there a couple of questions. So, as uh, I'm not a CEQA lawyer, are, which volatile organic chemicals were involved? In, are they actually dangerous? Like, what, what is the level of thing that is being mitigated here? The point, uh, the level at this stage is is benign because the case has gone through a remediation effort and the state water resources control board staff who is responsible for overseeing this case has acknowledged that the case has been closed but as a final condition of case closure the applicant is required to secure a, a final statement from the Regional Water Quality Control Board and a final test. Ultimately, to answer your question, a vapor barrier is going to be what is required, which is already required as far as uh, building code construction is concerned. But that vapor barrier ultimately is what is going to remediate any concerns with the volatile organic compound mist uh that remains as a potential concern for the regional water quality control board right i, I guess I'm, I'm not asking like how is mitigation going to be done i'm asking like what is the thing that's being mitigated it is vapor from the soil right what what substance is evaporating the soil i assume it's not water vapor uh actually it is yes it is uh if you'd like we could refer to uh, it's actually summarized in the staff report as well. It says volatile organic compounds. That's correct. But if we are interested, we could visit the hazardous materials section of the MND, which has a clear description of remaining regional water quality control board concerns and the means by which it will be remediated. If uh, Nishant, are you able to access that chapter and the section specific to remediation of EOC? Yeah, I'll have to stop sharing. And pull it up. Here it is. Uh, page 422 of the report, primarily carbon tetrachloride and tetrachloroethylene concentrations above the residential direct exposure ESLs. Does it list what heavy metal or what metals are there too? It says uh, primary concerns are soil, lead, nickel, hexavalent, chromium, cobalt, dieldrin, and shallow soil concentrations slightly above the current 2019 regional water board environmental screening levels ESLs for residential direct exposure. Right. However, if you refer to the hazards and hazardous materials section of the MND, the case GeoTracker ID was opened on January 9th, 2023, being managed by Ross Steenson, senior engineer and geologist at the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And on November 21st, 2023, mm -hmm. The Water Control Board approved the current conditions report and corrective action plan, mm -hmm. Appendix E. Mm -hmm. So there are two yeah. basic steps that are required to secure mm -hmm. the no further action determination from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Mm -hmm. Those steps and the methods to secure mm -hmm. the no further action determination mm -hmm. are the mitigation measures that are incorporated in the MMRP for this section of the MND. Uh, as in addition, we also have as Appendix E, the analysis and conclusions of the November 21st, 2023 
Water Quality Control Board, uh, Current Conditions Report and Corrective Actions Plan. So if you were looking for the specific vapor compounds that we are ultimately looking to remediate to 110%, those will be described in detail in Appendix E of the MND. Thank you. I'll continue with uh, more questions then, uh, if we're okay on that item. Uh, Daniel, let me ask you real quick. I, I'm going back to our, uh, I know we had a long discussion about a year ago. Well, what was the HCD issue that we were trying to come to grips with a year ago? And Yeah, the, the HCD issue was whether or not a SP330 pre-app could be exercised in a manner that resulted in fewer housing units being constructed than the city wanted. Typically, and, at and, the time, it, and the answer was it could. That, yes, the answer was that the the law locks in standards in effect at the time, irrespective of them. And I know it's moved, but what that site right now, what what is it zoned for? How many? Units? It's zoned for a greater number of units, but the delta is not as large uh, since the study session with the inclusion of the apartment building and, and the J80. Oh, sure. No, I know, I know that. But, of course, the other thing, when you talk about the number of units, those number of units could also have JD ADUs as well. So that number might be correspondingly higher, I suppose. I mean, well, that, not necessarily in as much no, no, that under the new densities, you would actually see something that would be more of an apartment building or a condo. No. That actually wouldn't have okay. JD. I know, I know it's good. But so in terms of our issue, so, so what we're looking at, and, I, and the shot you had it in your report, uh, you know, objective standards and safety issues. And you said uh, objective standards are limited. So my question is, since we don't have any objective standards that apply, they're not just limited, they are non-existent. Is that true or not true? There are a handful from the East Campbell Avenue Master Plan. Oh, okay. So I'm looking at the Master Plan uh, view in the report. Let's see there. Page two and three, so there's Setback standards, height standards, some of which they are uh, deviating from density standards. But <clears throat> all right, no, you're right. I got you. I remember that you said you looked at that. And then in terms of the the safety issue, or however we phrased it, and I, that came up. And the only one that we really had a year ago that I can remember was when they were going you know back out on the Dillon on the driveway. And now we don't have that issue anymore. That that's correct, right? So that's gone. That's gone away. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of the JADUs, I know, so they're separate legal units, but they can't be sold individually. But what does separate legal units mean? You could, you could rent it separate from rented. No. Oh, okay. Oh, that's what that, okay. And then in terms of the, uh, so we've got uh, three VLI units and one a moderate income units part of this project. But two are two are rentals and two are for sale. Okay. And in terms of the, the rental ones, I know that we said in there that that's required to keep that in perpetuity for a lot of many, many years. But in terms of the for sale units, how does that work? When when they're sold, somebody buys them at, at a at a very low income uh, household buys a unit and they want to sell, do they have to continue to sell it to a very BLI? I think the I think the developers yes, the bonus units probably more of a Stephen question have a component of equity share. I'm not entirely sure of the mechanics, but the units either sold to another eligible household or if not the city gets a portion of the, the equity okay. that that homeowner would otherwise receive. So if we would just get the funds some, for our affordable there's some some safeguards. Okay. All right. And uh let's see. Oh, yeah, well, the Dillon driveways, you don't have to worry about. Oh, uh, and we did talk about the five trees are going to be removed, the 13 on the site, so there's eight trees staying on the site. No, there's 13 trees um, being added. Being, re being removed. Five trees being removed on site, 13 trees being removed. And eight trees are staying, though, I guess, I don't know. Are there, are there 13 trees on the site altogether, or five being removed, or no? Sorry, um, five trees. Yeah, five trees are being removed. Some are, are remaining, and then a few are just part of These are kind of picky, picky. And then the two more picky items here about in 
on Gilman on the driveways, it looks like I thought in the report we said two entrances and one exit. And then I, when I looked on the drawings, it looked like there were two exits and one entrance. So I'm just trying to clarify on the uh, driveway situation. So the smaller. So this right here will be an entrance, but there's no exit from here. And this right here will be both an entrance. Entrance. That's okay. So just the one exit, and it's and it's back. And a uh, couple. I got a couple of questions for the developer. Uh, picky questions, but just one final one for you. Very minor, but I we talked about the number of parking and uh, so it's at two units per townhome. Fifty plus six, fifty six plus eight. So I got. I counted 64 and you said it's 65 in your report. So I don't, I don't care what the number is, especially 64, 65, but just, uh, just FYI on that. Double check that. No biggie, just one of the point for now. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so some quick questions. The one that is uh, moderate, that still counts as affordable. Anything above moderate doesn't count. That that's 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 market rate, right? At least I believe the gradations are moderate bump. Right. Okay. And then um, and I needed a little bit more clarification, maybe just restating of so the fire truck the um, I don't know, maybe public works is the best one to answer that, but you said the driveways were not made as wide to discourage speeding in and out. Right. So this driveway right here, in order to meet the fire district's uh, turning radius requirements, would need to be widened. The concern there was having too wide of a driveway would encourage um, regular vehicles to speed. It's just easier to, to navigate. So um, rather than completely widening the driveway, a portion of it would be a half, four and a half inch curve. That's tall enough to deter a regular size car from speeding, but it's low enough that a fire truck, if needed, can drive over. Effectively, they have an entrance that's wide enough. But now, what about the other uh, entrance at the very right side of the project closer to them? That uh, is that a fire truck exit or fire truck entrance? I believe that would just be an exit, or they would back out as the turner. Yeah, they. The interior is being designed as a turnaround, so they'll go in and pull out around. So they don't need. They, to, they don't need. They it. don't need to use that. Yeah, they won't use it. Okay, and then thank you. And then the final question: You mentioned due to high frequency transit, the parking requirements is really zero. I understand that, but by that you mean the and the light room. You don't mean high frequency buses. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's close to a light rail um, station. So we have maps that kind of lay out the areas where it's hard to find. Right, right. But I mean, when I said high frequency, uh, you weren't referring to buses, you were referring to the light rail station. Right. Okay, I just want to comment. Yeah, I mean, there are parts of the city that do have high frequency bus service that does qualify for AB 2097. Right. But, but not here. Here, it's just a light rail. Thank you. That's it. Sure. To be clear, yeah. I think the 26 buses every 15 minutes. Is so I had a question um, about the rental units. So who, who actually will own those units? What are the requirements around that? Well, the developer will own the, the apartment building or sell it to somebody else who would rent it as a, as a business. And then in terms of the PMR rental units, the city's housing have uh, the affordable housing uh, administrator, House Keys, does the administration of those units. Basically, identifies eligible households that are that are eligible to. Rent. The city does that. The city's con contractor, basically. Uh, okay, so it's going to be separate city from the property owner. Sorry? It's totally separate. Correct. And there's a it's a complicated process, but it's something the city guides. 
the property owner would still enter the lease agreement if the uh, tenant gets they get the reduced rent. Excellent. And there's also a time uh, in the right, like 55 years, 30 years, where if it's sold, it's going to be sold at lower price, but after the time is expired, then it can be sold at market rate. You're talking about the for sale units then? Uh, they are restricted for, uh, well, trying to, trying to remember the, um, uh, that, it, that is uh, actually taken care of by an equity sharing arrangement rather than by a restriction on the time period. Uh, there, there are some units that may be restricted time-wise based on our own inclusionary ordinance. But I, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, the, um, the, the density bonus law does not place a time restriction on for sale. Uh, when we spoke about this a year ago, one of the things we talked about was a 10 foot setback on the right side. Like on this map right now, we needed a 10 foot setback because of like the East Campbell zoning plan or something. Like, did that get resolved? It did. So um, it actually turned out that our um, GIS data was not totally accurate. Our determination of which parcels fell into the East Campbell Avenue Master Plan versus the South uh, Area Plan were incorrect. So, what it actually is the case is that all the townhome uh, parcels south of the site Yeah, so you can kind of see it. the uh, parcels fronting Gilman, those are all in the south of Campbell area plan, and it's just the 16 LN parcel with the apartment units that's in the East Cape. Okay, got so it. So that step back standard doesn't actually apply. Um, in the parking spaces for the people that live in the apartment complex, do they, are the ones shown there meant for them or had like, what was, what is that meant to be? Those are meant for the apartments. And how many are there? There are eight units there. Okay. Uh, and commissioner, other commissioners have asked a lot of my other questions, primarily about like the safety of vapor and other things. So that's all I got. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yeah, most of my questions have been asked. Uh, just just uh, one clarification on the on the uh, the, the uh, soil issue. So, to be clear, um, the, the developer will excavate exca excavate the soil. And then an inspector will come out from the Water Quality Board to do an on-site test to confirm that it's in compliance. We will work with a third-party um, consultant that, that maybe they've already worked with before. Um, they'll do the testing to provide that information to. Okay, but it, but it will be tested and confirmed. Okay, and then the only other this is stupid, but I've never heard this term before: aerial access. That is that for fire? Yeah, for ladder. Oh, for ladder. Act. Oh, area by the ladder. I was thinking helicopter. So, <laughs> so yeah, the fire department has kind of two main sizes of trucks. So the area one is the bigger one that requires a lot more space, and it's kind of what drives a lot of the interior site layout projects. It also limits the height of buildings. It's okay. Uh, okay. Good. Okay. I like to learn something that we that we that we need. So, um, you know, the other questions were answered, and and this is like the at least the third, maybe fourth time. 
uh, we, we, it's, it's come to us. Uh, I was on the Sarge list too. So, um, uh, you know, when it first came, it, it was, uh, there were a number of things. I think that it's, it's part of, you know, why it's taken a while is that there had to be, this thing had to be revisited significantly. So, uh, uh, I think that makes sense in terms of the timing. Um, I don't have any other questions. I don't have any questions, so we'll uh, we'll open it up for um, uh, the applicant, the representative, who uh, free to come and speak to us. If you'll come up and turn on the mic, and the, the, the round thing. So it's yeah, it's yeah, the, okay. Yeah, okay. Just take your hand. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And good evening, commissioners. My name is Richard E. I'm a project manager for Remsen Farms. Farms is also with me tonight. Uh, you reviewed our residential project at study session last April. At that time, we proposed 29 units and discussed an option to increase the unit count to 47. Your general consensus that night was to realize the option, and you asked and encouraged the staff to help us. So I'm happy to report to you that our updated design provides 47 residential units. We achieved this 62% increase through density bonus, in addition of JDUs and, and apartment building. Um, so as stated in staff's pre presentation, we are requesting several waivers, but no concessions. The first slide uh, shows our uh, five, five unit uh, townhomes along Gilman Avenue. And these are pictures of similar rooms and projects in the city at Campbell. The new townhomes and apartment building will have the same architectural design quality, craftsmanship, and detailing. Quick aerial view of our six parcel assemblage for our project site. And we also have existing photos, photos of the existing neighborhood. So as you see, we, we did replace the four townhomes on Dillon Avenue with a 10 unit apartment building. Um, the main driveway is um, off of Gilman Avenue. And so that wider driveway that you see is where a fire truck would enter. And, and that intersection there is essentially a hammerhead, which allows the fire truck to also then turn around and come back out. The driveway to the immediate, to all the way to the right, that is for, um, Exit on the um, the uh, and and so that main driveway also then provides uh, access to the assigned parking for the building. The um, there is obviously pedestrian access on Dillon and Gilman. The front doors for both the apartment building and townhomes face the public street, and this visual and physical connection is pedestrian friendly and ties our new community to their neighbors. Although parking is not required because project sites within half mile major transit stop, we have two covered parking spaces per townhome unit, six gas parking stalls, and eight assigned apartment building parking spaces for a total of 64 on-site parking spaces. And this doesn't include the five additional street parking spaces on Gilman and Dillon created by the elimination of existing curb cuts. We're, we're providing diverse and affordable housing options. We have two, three, and four bedroom townhomes. We are offering studio one and two bedroom apartment units and junior accessory dwelling units. The JADUs can provide a source of income as legally rentable units to subsidize homeowners' mortgage payments. Here's a close review of our five unit townhomes along Gilman. There are interior duet townhomes. And once again, our apartment building as view uh, long on Dillon. So as uh, the shot noted, we are continuing to refine the exterior building elevations. And similar to our process for our Madison townhomes down the street next to the city courtyard, we are proposing to work with staff regarding our building exterior design findings. Um, I, I did want to just speak briefly about the environmental 
aspects of our, we, we have actually mitigated for the vapor gas soil. Um, really what's left to, to clean up on that site is lead from older structures. And, and we really can't do that until we take down existing buildings there. Our corrective action plan does outline the actions that we will take to do that. Testing is done by our consultant. Those tests are uh, submitted to the water board. And uh, it's, it has to be their, to their satisfaction. Um, and, and if they're satisfied, obviously they issue a local reaction letter to us. Um, so in closing, our, our project, well, they, oh, the, uh, so, and, and also I just want to make correct that uh, there is the requirement for us to install a vapor barrier. Is there a vapor barrier as has indicated by the industries? There is no, no, no requirement to. It's not required. Um, so our project will complement the character of the existing neighborhood, uh, the articulated building forms and use of high quality materials. Look and feel like our vast and townhomes, which are character defining for the emerging residential neighborhood. So appreciate your consideration of our project tonight, and we respectfully ask for your approval. We certainly look forward to starting construction schedules. Thank you. Um, just for our education, um, what, what, from your perspective, for most of the time between the initial presentation a year ago and today, how much of a, I guess, how much of a hassle for the environment navigation and all that? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it does take the steps that, uh, Articulate. I mean, I mean, we obviously we had to update our site plan to swap out the town homes. We, um, we did go through uh, our own design process of the roof on the design, and there was SARC and uh, preparation of exhibits. I mean, all that takes time. I guess I'm asking: Is there anything the city did that made it take longer than it would have otherwise? No, I mean, staff is great to work with. I, I, I'm sure I'm answering your question. No, no, I, I, if there, there's no. not a there there, then that answers my question. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yee, I just, you saw that you mentioned, so, uh, uh, you know, again, for our edification, because more, more of these projects will be coming. So you could have gone without any parking at all. Did you, did you ever consider that as anything viable, as a viable option? For a project to go without any parking or minimal parking, I don't know how you would create a project like this without providing any parking and think that it would have impact to to your to your neighbors. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I just would, wonder just if, if you even thought about it. If it even came up as, a, as an option, you know, just something that you just completely. Well, said, I mean, we understood it's not feasible. You're just not going to. We understood we had that that option, but I but we didn't think that 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 was really creating the type of neighborhood that. that to be if you had gone without parking, were there more units you could have put on the site? Maybe you didn't look at it that way, but I, I don't I'm just looking so. at, I'm not, looking not, at not future projects on, kind of thing. No, not based on the product that we're building. Well, I, I just thought I'd ask. Uh, and so there's 33 lots, 26 private and seven common. So what are the, how, do the, how does that break out? What are the seven common lots? Is that, the, the common area lots would be like the landscaping, the landscaping, the, the private stuff. street. Okay. And the, the twenty-six the, private the, lots are the are the twenty-five townhomes and the apartment. And the apartment building. Okay. Yes. Uh, and you needed the extra two foot uh, of height just on the apartment building, not on the townhomes. Is that? Well, uh, yeah. Apparently, 45? we we've we've uh, gone above the forty-five. Yeah. Well, and, but and you, I was so I was going to ask you why you needed those extra two feet, but yeah, you, sounds like you're not exactly sure. I mean, it, it, I would say that it probably that that building has, as as at its height probably serves a good transition between the Crystal condos and the buildings to the to the other side of us. Well, just yeah, I just didn't know why you needed the the two feet over the over the uh, the max, but it's just on the apartment building. So I, I guess it mitigates it from either side. I don't know what Cressley and the other project, just the 
south of you are you know shorter. And just my final question: Oh, the parking stalls are uh, under under standard size. I think I saw that. Is that going to be an issue for our? Uh, what's the upshot of that? Is that a problem for tenants or? We we're just trying to create. We're just a little short on the length. We're trying to just create a little more landscaping. I think 16 feet instead of 20. Well, it's 16 standard. plus a two foot overhang. So effectively, we have 18 instead of 20. Okay. Yeah. Again, 18, 18 is a it's it's pretty, pretty small. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, a uh, simple question. What, uh, following up what, what my colleague from book Bookbinder was asking, you know, we know our staff are great, you know. My question is, are there any processes that you thought were redundant, any processes that could have been um, optimized or, you know, made more efficient that you could miss it? Tell us about it. Okay. Well, maybe Mark was trying to tell you but, you know, well. Because you guys are the experts, you know, so we're trying to do that. Thank you. Good evening. Members of the commission, C staff, for the record, my name is Mark Robeson. No, I don't, there's nothing in the process that you guys are doing that are creating delays. It's, we're, we spend a lot of time ourselves thinking about <clears throat> how we can make the process go faster. But right now, it's, and we're not done designing. I don't know if you picked that up from Richard, but we're still designing these buildings. We'll continue to design to get them where we want them. And it takes time. And with our own design team, I mean, they're busy. I mean, people, our engineers, our architects have other projects and they're busy. It's just, and we ask ourselves the same question, why can't we get this done faster? So it's, but we have three different building types, you know, in a relatively small site. And it's not just one, there's three different buildings. So that adds to the work, but it also helped us get the density and the unit mix that we were trying to get. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, continue with my questions. I saw the four story building the job on Gilman, do you have, uh, I believe you will have elevators in there, right? It's a three half story. No, we don't have them. Oh, okay. That's a surprise. Oh. And, then, uh, uh, and then the second, and, and then last question is, the uh, uh, 12 JADUs belong to some of the 25 towns, correct? They are, they are a part of the, uh, the five, five unit town homes so that I'm getting happy. Okay. So, so they're not independent units of their own. They are part of the, um, they're, they're attached to the primary structure. Thank you. Uh, my questions were answered. Um, you guys always do. Based on my seven years of seeing that. Uh, my question for on process efficiency and recovery. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have I mean, just about the elevator. We we that question was asked uh, last time, and I think Daniel answered that there's no requirement for there's a cutoff, right? At, at three, at, uh, there's some kind of regulation that does not require uh, an elevator for for this uh, for this uh, kind of complex, right? Yeah, I don't recall the details, but that's this plus your D buyer built in position. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't have any more. I don't have any more. Yeah. Well, I have to ask Mr. Yen. I, I, I know you guys have done a lot of really good projects. I agree with my fellow commissioners here. But uh, is, is there any EV parking or solar uh, energy components in the project? We, we see. I, I believe there's a solar requirement for the town. There is with the park building. Uh, and I believe we do have EV, one EV for the you know, got an EV spot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? With me, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, there, is there anybody else who uh, wanted to speak on this? Uh, anybody else? You know where I'm online? Okay. I'll close that and we'll move to discussion by the commissioners. Mr. Fields.
uh, supportive of this project. Great to see the changes over the last year as we saw iterations in the project design. Uh, these seem like really nice apartments. Great to see them next to Campbell Park. Uh, hope to see all of Campbell Park filled out too, so we don't have empty space in such a sort of gateway pinnacle part of our town. Uh, but these look great. Hope they can get built quickly. Yeah, like like I said, you guys always do a really nice job, very thoughtful. And even from the comments that were made tonight, it's clear that a lot of time um, goes into making sure that these are high quality and provide all of the um, detail and requirements that people need to really feel at home in the places that they live. So. Thanks for putting together such a great project this time and, you know, throughout the last seven years that I've seen. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I also think it's a great project, you know, excellent presentations. The, the two um, items that I like to um, uh, recommend is um, what you said, EV. EV space is this EV charging or EV parking only? Charging. Charging. Perfect. Okay, so that's great. And so my only other recommendation is please consider adding a, I know it may not be a requirement, but adding a um, elevator. Uh, it increases your markets, uh, you know, of people who would be able to use these, uh, use the higher floors at this project. Otherwise, great project. Great. Yeah, also in support. Yeah, I think it's a good project from the developer that's done a lot of good projects here in uh, Campbell. And uh, it is, you know, it's just a drop in the bucket, but it's nice to see uh, uh, at least three VLI units coming to fruition. And, uh, and you know, the JADUs will be affordable, you know, just by their nature, I guess. So uh, it's a good, good project for Campbell. I'm happy to see this come before us. Um, my, my main concern is that, you know, we have yet to see a pro uh, one of these projects that doesn't involve different design standards or some waivers and so forth. I'm worried about our MFDS and that they actually make things possible to build. Um, I think that uh, 10 unit apartment building looks amazing. Uh, I'm really excited to see this uh, going up, hopefully. Um, I'm just really excited to see this coming back for planning commissions. It's an excellent project. I'm really excited that yeah, you mentioned it in some more units that we're going to get the, a really nice set of residential units like right by downtown. It's an excellent project. I'm very happy to see it. Um, I forgot to ask when, um, if I can ask, when will this be? When do you expect to start construction? It'll be. Thank you. Um, very excited to see this project. That's what I got. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great project. Um, uh, I, I go down, I walk down to the park quite often, and I, I notice the, uh, the, the, the light industrial area. And, Always wishing it to kind of go away, <laughs> and so I'm also hoping that the Cresley like some market starts going up. Um, so I, I'm excited about this. It fills in a nice piece of uh, of, uh, of Gilman Avenue and and the department center. You know, I, I you know the whole elevator thing. It's not, it's late in the game, and, and so I'd ask that question at the study session. Uh, there's not a requirement. I'm sensitive to ADA stuff and, and uh, but disabled requirement, disabled requirements in terms of, and I'm an old guy, so it's like, I wouldn't want to walk upstairs. So, uh, but, you know, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. So, um, be late to think about putting an elevator in. Um, uh, I think it's a great project. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, seeing it come to fruition, and I wish you guys uh, much luck. So can we um, have a motion? 
somebody other than Commissioner Craig Dow. You like it? Oh, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I want to do it. I know he does. <laughs> I don't really want to do it. I know. I, I moved that the uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Adopt a resolution recommending the City Council adopt a mitigated negative declaration to approve plan development permit density bonus request tentative subdivision permit tree removal permit. Uh, I have a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Kamkar. Uh, motion. Motion by Commissioner Buckbinder. We have a vote. Commissioner Fields. Aye. Commissioner Strasky. Aye. Commissioner Gray. Aye. Commissioner Buckbinder. Aye. Commissioner Kamkar. Aye. Chair Sissy. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Next item is land use subcommittee progress report. Commissioner Kamkar, I assume you're taking the lead on this. Yes. Um, so much. Let's see. I'm going to start sharing. Actually, can I, can I ask for like a three minute break? Yes, for break? I think so. All right. So we'll get back to your chair. Let's have a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, the progress report of the uh, land use subcommittee, Commissioner uh, Ostrowski and myself are on this committee, and the um, you know we've been we have met a couple times regarding the um, regarding the direction that we're taking this, and the issue is some of the uh, densities that have come as a result of our last update, the gaps that are in the densities and um, uh, some of the uh, ways that, for example, gross acre versus net acre and how they affect different properties, you know, that's what our subcommittee is trying to explore, to see what's the level that we're talking about. Um, I was reading San Jose um, Spotlight, you know, it's like a publication, a inter publication that they have some charts regarding Campbell, which they say they got from HCD. Um, this is the first one they said. They said we produced 230 homes um, on 2018. 2019, in 2019, went down to 45. 2020 went down to 25. 2021 went down to 3. Now, this is over to later. Um, you know, so it's understandable. And then 2022, 33, and based on our latest Reno numbers, we need to be doing 372 to meet our stated Reno numbers. This is annual, you know, for the next seven or eight years to be able to uh, make what we said we will make. Now, I... I don't blame the staff for this. I blame us. We are the body of the council. It's the body that um, has to make this happen, you know. And so, um, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I want to be clear as to at least what my opinion is on this one. Now, if this was all homes, this is the affordable homes that they reported. We had 2018, we had 18, 5 in 2019, 0 in 2020. 0 2021 and 1 in 2022 and the average is to be at 211 you know so it's it's kind of mind-boggling you know um what we need to do to be able to get close can i make a clarification because i went to say i actually wrote, uh, I wrote the other thing. they use the term affordable homes in reality we're talking about affordable housing units okay so it's not implication supportive of home since then it's a home. But the, the arena is affordable housing units. That includes apartments. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes. so they mean that they mean that house as opposed to this apartment could be a home. Well I understand that but but the, the term that H uh, C D uses, the terms that we should be using is housing units. So when people see the average person says affordable homes they're not thinking about the apartment that it's for rent. It's a, that's important. So I just, just for clarification, we are talking about it. Right? Okay. You know, thank you for clarification, man. I think that's fine. I think, you know, I agree with that. So the next, uh, the next three slides, they compare the different cities in, in Santa Clara County. 2018, 2020, and 2022. 2018, uh, Campbell, you know, was at zero. Now, this doesn't mean the building it means zero per 1,000. Uh, you know, it could the numbers could have been less than half, and that's why it rounds down to zero. But but still, you know, um, it, it tells us that we gotta we gotta try harder. Um, the, for 2020, we're still at zero, and for 2022. We're still at zero, you know, and again, I see this as we have to step up, you know, as as the body that makes recommendation to the council and works with staff, you know, we have to step up, you know, this is staff doesn't have ability to, to make this more, it's us. Now, the next um, slide I want to share with you is, uh, I we did a comparison between previous, you know, densities versus now density is in effect. As you can see previous as as you can see 
as you can see previously we had two two gaps between the um, uh, light to medium density residential and medium density residential there was one gap and another gap between the medium density residential and medium to high density residential and each of those gap was a gap of one unit from 20 to 21 and from 13 to 14. In the new plan that passed, there are four gaps, one of them a double gap, one of them a, you know, now, when I was down at uh, uh, Long Beach going through commissioner training, I was talking to other, you know, city um, attorneys, to city planners and, you know, to other planning commissioners and staff. And one of the things that, you know, they were sort of surprised about, they go, how could you have gaps? You know, why would you need gaps in your density? You know, they were, you know, um, they couldn't explain, explain to me as to if, if not, not a single one had gap that I had talked to, and they couldn't understand why I have gaps. Um, Actually, okay. So, uh, so the comparison that we're making here is yes, we did bring the, we did increase the density in different ranges. This is single family homes, and in general, densities went up uh, twenty nine percent, twenty two percent, and twenty five percent in the three different levels of single family densities that we have. Same thing with uh, to low to medium density residential. The uh, range of densities went up 23%, again 23%, 25% for the medium density, 22% for the medium to high density, and there was no high density before, now we have high density. However, as you can see, I have a one here and a two here for footnotes and a three. And if you look at it, this is based on traditional gross acreage. That's that's when you calculate the area of that lot all the way to the center of the street. The new way of calculating, we don't do that. We go to the edge of the street and that extra 30 foot, that's usually the half half width of a street, you know, uh, pretty standard in, in uh, Campbell, actually makes a big difference for smaller lots. And you could actually, if you have a 100 by 100 foot lot, and you take away the 30 foot street on either side, like a corner lot, the area is reduced more than half. So from 100 to 100, which gives you 10,000, go to 70 by 70, that's 4,900. It's not even 5,000. 5,000 would be half, 4,900 with less than half. And there's additional cuts because you, you round the curbs, you know. So thank God staff acknowledges the properties that are on the corner that go through this. You know, um, one of the efforts of this committee is to so that it's not just the corner um, lots that go through this, it's also the interior lots, the lots next to the corner lots that could also lose, you know. And, um, so, um, so this is basically what this uh, plan is saying. Now, there are some good news. The good news, which, you know, I had a meeting with um, the director and he, you know, told me about SB 684 that may be coming. Um, actually, it is passed already, but it hasn't, it, the effectiveness hasn't started. July 1st is when it takes effect. SB 684, in layman's term, does for multifamily housing what SB 9 did for, or SB 10, I should say, did for single family housing, to a point where it allows up to 10 units on any multifamily homes as long as the minimum size units are um, created. So if this if this does take effect in Campbell and it's not watered down, it will 
take care of all the concerns that, you know, this properties would have suffered. Um, they, they have a, they could use this, uh, this state law to propose their thing. So for this group, there might be a salvation. This group, however, you know, I don't know of any yet, you know, and, and hopefully with enough, you know, data, we could uh, show that, you know, maybe, maybe there should be something, you know, and staff should rethink the densities, you know, at least for the uh, single family. The next slide I want to... Maybe, maybe just to put this a little bit in context for people in terms of their, um, kind of their lots, right? So the the third row, which is the less than 7.5 okay. per acre, that's, that's the 6,000 square foot lot yes. zoning. Yes. And yes. then the, the slightly lower are the, I believe, 12,000. 15,000. But I think the key thing is that a lot of people in the residential uh, zoning group will be affected depending on the relative dimensions. Right. Well, well, one other thing that we're doing that actually, you know, it's like putting salt on the wound, if you will, is when we come up with a when you do the calculation, come up with a number of the units allowed, instead of rounding to the up or down or whatever, we always round down. This rounding down is actually takes away. So for example, if you do the calculation and come up with 3.9 units that's allowed on this land, instead of saying, well, we will make that four, you know, you round it up to four. You know, the way we do it right now at Campbell, this is what Daniel tells me. We take away the point nine, it becomes three units. And it's like, you know, well, uh, some of these units have already lost because the gross acre, the traditional gross acre um, calculation was changed. Um, why not change the rounding down so that at least they don't lose as much? Um, the, the next uh, item, the next. Uh, Thing that I want to show you is that, uh, so the question is, do any actual parcels exist that go through this? Because I know last time when we had given scenario as to different categories where this could occur, um, of course, I haven't had a chance to go through all the parcels in the city because I think we're talking tens of thousands of parcels. But the, the some of the ones that I have gone through, I have found actual parcels that, you know, actually go through this. And I'm trying to see if, does this change it? Okay, so you could see, I haven't, um, I haven't, I'm not disclosing actual APN, even though I have it. I just want to give you an idea, like in this area, which is, uh, I believe this color is like light, light to medium. No, this is light to medium density, and this is Hacienda. Like in Hacienda, you know, there was quite a few. Um, on this area, there was, there was, there was at least two that I found. Not that I checked everything, but, but a few of the ones I found, I found two that were affected. Up here, oh, got affected. This is Kennedy. Kennedy, actually, you know, I found a property that lost three. Beforehand, it had 11. After, it would only get eight. So it lost three unit allotments. And this is in a, we're in a, in a, in a type of environment where we have a housing crisis. We want to increase units, you know, not chop away from their um, allotments, you know. Um, so, um, again, there is more, but this is the, this is just a progress report that I wanted to show. Now, 
Um, I understand that staff is going to make a presentation on 684, if I'm not mistaken, director, next next time. This is probably still on schedule. Uh, 684 does go into effect in July. At your next planning commission meeting, we're providing you a legislative update on that and the related laws. And you'll be getting that next planning commission. Thank you, sir. So, um, so hopefully we will learn more about that because because that could actually make, you know, most of what this committee is doing, if that, you know, does take into effect. Potentially. Potentially, you know. There's still, there's still single family issues that, you know, can be concerned, but that would be a much lesser burden to check that versus check every, you know, parcel. Um, and it's not a simple, can, simple calculator. You really have to look at quite a few things to be able to make it. Can I ask a question? I think, I think I'm sure. um, I just want to offer a perspective. So, are we actually developing these single family parcels to have more than one unit on them? I think we have a few unit OSB 9 applications. Mostly we're getting ADUs, which is how we densify in these, these neighborhoods. Um, and the vast majority of land is some flavor of LDR, which SB 684 does not apply. It was originally meant to, but there was last minute shenaniganry and it doesn't. However, the city does control its own land use. We could decide otherwise. We could say, okay, the things you can do with SB 684, if you hire density land, you can do single family zones or the LDR zones. We could recommend that and send it up the pike to the city council if we wanted to do that. Um, could, you, could you repeat that? So, SB 684 is a state law which says that we have to allow certain kinds of densification in multi-family uh, multi zones. No, not single family. Right. We could, as a city, change the zoning code so that you could do that in single family zones as well. That was what the law originally was going to do. It was changed at the last moment. We could still change our zoning code to allow that. If we want to allow more density in single family zones, that's one way of doing that. And then, then, then pragmatically, what would that be in terms of, give me an example, does that mean a single family lot could then put uh, 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 an apex on it? Is that, is that I, I don't understand. I think, I do not know exactly how SG684 works. I think it's a bunch of tiny homes. You get like a cottage court. Say so again? You get like a cottage court as opposed to like, a, so the Robeson project, the 10 unit building. I don't think you could do something like that. I think if you have the idea is that you have like a large lot, something like a lot of little lots and like little cottages on it. So, uh, so I read six eighty four, and it's a little bit more flexible. So if you, so I think you would be able to have like a condominium unit where it has ten. You know, the some of the limitations are no more than ten. Now, that doesn't mean you have to build 10, you can build four, you can build three, you know, but no more than 10. Um, and, um, and then there are some other, you know, some other, uh, uh, I guess, limitations, but not to a point where we discourage, like, you know, someone to build it. But but just like Commissioner McQuarrie said, City Council doesn't have to say single family can build 10. They can say, you know, up to and I'm up to four. So, so city council can decide if something similar from the six eight four flavor would be just for our, for our single family. And if you look at the map, all the yellow are single family. All the yellows on the map are single family. So it's not small. So we don't. So it's not like single family. It's a small portion of our city. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I well, think the light orange that you've set the couple of places you've picked. Those are also single. Those are also single family. They're just a little bit bigger lot, right? Well, no. instead of it being a, a no, no, no. yellow, yellow and light orange, orange is a little bit smaller. No, no, yellow, yellow is like six thousand, and orange is twelve thousand square. I see. Okay. Well, thank you for for correction. Yellow is about six thousand. So that's a standard. Orange is about eight thousand. The so-called green, like green, is ten thousand. So, yes, um, 
So can I ask you a question about this thing where you said there's a lot, a lot over there on the west side, the southwest side, where, where uh, right now, based on what we have in place, they will you only put eight on it. But you, in theory, if you went out to the street and uh, you know, right. then it would be eleven. Okay. So, but but that's a you, is that is that a single family parcel? That's not a single family. It is parcel. not a single. This particular example that we're talking about, eight to eleven, that is not a single family person. Or it's just a big, big parcel. It is. I mean, it is not a huge parcel because there's not very many empty parcels. Yeah. Well, right. well, many times you take something that's not used anymore, has something on it, you can buy it, you you demo it, and you build brand new. So it doesn't have to be an empty parcel. This could happen to also that has a structure on it, but it's not being used. Um, and, so, um, and so what I can say is that our general plan, when we updated it, even though we increased density, but because, you know, we changed from gross to net acre, uh, the, and this being a corner property, like a, you know, corner properties are getting double bands, getting it from so, so it lost its 11 allotments. Now it can do a maximum of eight. Now, if somebody were to buy this lot and want to pay, probably say, I'm going to be doing six. Fine, you know, that's your choice. But it's the allotment that gives the owner of the bank. Yeah, I understand. I was under the impression, though, that the subcommittee was intended to show that there's, uh, to, to look at the density and the the change in the um, the change in the, the net decrease. The, the, the decrease um, would, would have more than a small that, that would have a significant difference in terms of how many how much more units we could put in Campbell and 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 you know so I, I guess you haven't gotten to that yet because most of that with all due respect Commissioner Gamcard much of what you've told us we you had actually already talked about talked about the gaps you talked about with the uh, the smaller lot sizes uh, the, the curves of some of the script we, all, we already heard about that uh, I, I was of the impression you were going to be investigating and creating data that would show that there was be a significant you know the, the eight versus 11 is all speculative that, that person might just build a big house right? have one Okay, so we don't really know, and, and we don't know how many there's potential for, uh, and, and whether that number is even has any significance. Because, you know, uh, if we're talking about gaining a couple, a few dozen more, then it's it's not worth the. From my personal opinion, it's not worth thinking about going back and modifying the general plan, the housing element. If if all we're going to potentially have, depending on what people decide to do, uh, that maybe we gain a few dozen more uh, in the next eight years. So to me, it was a, to me it was like, is there enough evidence to suggest that that number could be significant? So uh, I would probably say I have looked at ten percent of the city, and I found twenty of. 20 unit loss, meaning that if the if the homeowner, developer, whoever wants to maximize the number of units you build on it all, just like our previous project did, and most developers want to do, you know, so they make their money. Um, old versus new, they if this 10% sample is so they already lost. Yeah, I mean, I think like just taking it up a little bit, you know, the goal of the all the updates that we made last year was to really look and we spent a lot of time doing it was how and where are we going to be able to create the housing demand and the additional units and all of that. And so, you know, inadvertently within that process, we, you know, kind of took a step in the opposite direction with what Commissioner Camcar has identified. So, you know, 
whether it's a couple dozen, that's the threshold for reconsidering it, you know, it's significant in that only looking at 10% of the units in the city, it's already a couple dozen. It does take a bit of time, quite a bit of time to go through, but I think even the the information that we have so far is worth taking this forward, but it is going to take a bit more time. Absolutely. If I think, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere between, I think, I read somewhere there's 42,000 parcels. I said, that could be wrong. But, you know, I mean, but there's just, there's, there's, there's only 17,000 households in the city. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. sure. No, 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 that's, that's households. Quite sure. But, well, but, but it's not just residential parcels. Yeah, but we're not we're not talking about commercial parcels. We're talking about residential. It's just that to put the one going more, you know, you have to identify, you know, if the commercial, the residential, if the, you know, retail, you know, actually you have to identify that and then set aside the ones that we're not looking at and just looking at the. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it too is that the, um, uh, the gross lot area, you know, basically the definition of what we call the gross lot area changed through the process of the updates, but the terminology wasn't adjusted. So during that process, I think that, you know, as a planning commission, we weren't, it wasn't um, something that we considered because it didn't look like a difference, which is, you know, something that we probably could have caught and, you know, been more careful to consider as we went through, but there are a lot of details in that, in the processes that we went through and everything that we reviewed. So, you know. Yeah, but I, I, I you know, I would take, I would take uh, the question of it being important based on what the, what the staff said last time we were here when we were talking about this was that that was not an advert. It was part of the plan that they submitted in terms of the general plan of housing. And they took that into consideration. We reviewed it. Uh, the council reviewed it. Um, they made a conscious decision to change that. They made an upgrade in densities that made it, what I understand, if I remember the top of the reads, the wash. Made a wash. It was a wash between reducing the densities and, and bringing up of reducing the, the lot size uh, the, from Center Street to the curb, um, and then and then increasing the densities ended up it being essentially Washington. And the, the so I don't think it was inadvertent. I think uh, from what I heard from the staff that that was uh, viewed, looked at, presented, and and the decision was made at, at the council. Yeah, exactly. And I think the key thing is that the fact that the fact that it was considered a wash was an assumption without looking at the details and now we're looking at the details and understanding that depending on the configuration of the lot it's actually not a wash well, that's step, the point step. well it's, it's a wash in terms of maybe this person over here can't build as many units but we're going to build more units over here that's that's how it, it theory is going to work so yes, maybe this this parcel over here will not speculatively would not put this, be able to put as many units on it, uh, but that we're going to make up for it because we have of uh, these other higher density areas put in for residential. So that's how it gets balanced out. If I can respond to that, it is not that this neighbor cannot has been. It's that this neighbor lost allocation. This neighbor had an allocation and he lost it. There's the Not that here's one neighbor, here's two neighbor, this got two more units, this one didn't get more units. I cannot. No, I understand, that. but the but wash means lost. that something goes down, something else comes up and it balances out. Yeah, but the wash was supposed to be on, we are recalculating the area of the lot because we're not taking the part that goes to the middle of the street. And we're also saying you can. The, the number of units per gross acre is also going up. Not that some people get more and some people can get less, but now 
inadvertently, some people are getting less. So there's two problems. One, some people are getting less, but the bigger problem is that we should be able to build more units and this change is making it so that we can't. This is like an unintended consequence when our goal is to build more units and we've defined ways for people to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah I would, I, I, I agree with everything you guys said has crystallized what I, what I, from our last conversation, what I thought we were doing is, uh, thinking about if we want to recommend to the city council that they relook at something that perhaps they really didn't look at mostly because so much stuff was going on at one time. And I agree with Commissioner Zister that, that what Stephen Rose uh, gave us a report the last meeting, he did say that there was a wash, some were gaining, some were losing. But what you guys are saying now uh, would really surprise me if, if after all that we did, we actually went the other way or taken away. And even, I think even a couple dozen units would make it, you know, would be relatively significant if it's a change that we didn't mean to make and we, we went wrong, the wrong way instead of the right way. So I think what we're trying to do, what I think, what I think, if I, if I may say so, what, what your committee, your subcommittee is trying to do is to bring the details and the facts that our planning committee, that we, our planning commission will first look at and say, yeah, you know, blah, blah, yeah, this, we think that we should recommend to the city council that they should relook at this because this is what happened. I think that's what we're probably doing. Right? I, think, I think you're exactly right. And um, we are a small city, so we want to have policies that favor your average, you know, homeowner. Not the big conglomerate, you know, developer coming in, and you know, and so, uh, and so we think, in inadvertently, I still believe it's inadvertently, the situation that came up is in uh, uh, disadvantages the uh, your mom and pop, you know, the versus the big conglomerate okay. that comes out. That's, that's, okay. well, that's, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, you can make that point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, it's a progress update, as uh, uh, Commissioner Kamkar said. You know, we heard from Commissioner Zister that we need to come back with more details. So we'll take that action and we will continue to work on it. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for listening to steps. Thank you. Good. Yep. Okay. Thank you for the report. Uh, report of the Community Development Director. It's fast. Uh, at last week's council meeting, uh, council reviewed three items that were by the planning commission. Uh, council approved the affordable housing overlay zones and by right zoning districts. If you can remember those to you twice. As is, is to include uh, fee reductions for deeply affordable housing projects. There was quite some discussion on that. Said so this reduces the amount of park impact fees that the city takes in. That the zoning districts were approved. Uh, two, the council approved the 2024 uh, second development plan. I believe our economic development manager, less than parks, presented to that at some point. Uh, if you had a chance, happy to pass on the link. It's a very robust document. If you looked at the city's previous economic development plan, I think it was 20 pages, about 250 pages. Uh, <laughs> set of proposals, uh, ambitious path, and comments. Expanded set of development programs. And very happy to report, I think the commission would be interested in this, uh, that the council approved in tandem with that, uh, the code updates that did streamlining to multiple commercial uses. Uh, that was the result of the ad hoc subcommittee uh, at that commission. So, uh, good news on all that. Very robust agenda last week. Uh, two things associated with that, kind of self-serving, but I'll say them anyways. Uh, the, the City Council acknowledged National Community Development Week, which is National Week, which was last week. And uh, I'm happy to report uh, the City of Campbell Planning Division has been honored by the American Planning Association, Northern California, with the Award of Excellence. Okay. Uh, putting all that aside, uh, I want to talk about two things, time and water, uh, which you can't find in the central place. 
So uh, one is, I know I want to speak by a few commissioners if there's an interest in changing the time. Uh, so just to refresh the commission, the council has changed their start time from 737. I think they reserve the right to go back to 730, but 7. So I'm trying to correct me if I have that one. And so it's not mandated at all. There's 14 commissions that start all over the spectrum. For example, the historic commission starts at 5. But if the planning commission wanted to follow suit, uh, we could absolutely do that. So that'd be the first question I'd ask through the chair. Uh, if there's interest of the commission in formal polling, if there is, we bring back a resolution at your next meeting and uh, to enact that to change your time. Uh, probably answering a question you'd ask, what does that mean for SARC? We could probably move the SARC meeting up. Uh, if it's a light agenda, I, we could work with staff and the SARC commissioners if there's if there's uh, if it's light to, to perhaps keep it closer to the right commission, I'll just have one of those two votes. So, anyways, I'll stop there and then uh, just a light item after that. If you have feedback on the time change, well, to me, it would be just a matter of whether or not there's a, a, a majority of commissioners that are interested in. Uh, I, I personally don't have a problem with coming at seven o'clock, it's fine with me. I'm seven. I don't, I don't work, so I like seven. So, <laughs> does everybody? It's fine. My, my kid goes to sleep at seven and wakes up like a farmer. So the earlier <laughs> cloud here, the better. Yeah. yeah. So there's a general consensus that seven would be fine for the planning commission. As far as SAR, you know, the only issue there is that, uh, you know, you could do a half an hour SAR if you had a one item. But I, I think if you had a couple items, uh, you probably need a six o'clock SAR. So that would be inconvenient for you know, pot, potentially six o'clock would be inconvenient for SARC members, but I, I, I don't want. I know it's late. I don't want to get in a big discussion, but something that Commissioner Fields said earlier, and with our objective standards, etc. Is there even a need for SARC anymore? It's really my question. I don't know. You know it's a great it's, question. Yeah, I've asked this uh, question of staff because I've had this question in my mind many, many times. So I'll just say right now it's in your ordinance code. It's required. Uh, I think. We're going to take the opportunity of the next six months to a year to relook at its purpose and its relevant these days, but for time being, it's still required. It's a little redundant, though. You know, almost, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, for commercial projects, industrial projects, it makes no sense. Well, it's presently required. Yes. So it's just a matter of whether or not, yeah. well, but, you know, we have to deal with what we have to deal with right it's now. It's a better process. That's yeah. it. If, if, if you if you're gonna look at it, that's that'd be good. But uh, you know, I I I did start for a year and a half, and you know, I don't know if if it made a difference to get that input at that point from from a, a commissioners or whether it was basically uh, you know just uh, a thing you go through. I mean, I think everybody's been on sound, right? Everybody everybody's been on sound. So I just don't know. Myself is, is whether or not it, it's meaningful. Uh, I, I know that there's a few instances where I saw things that I brought up that I think, as a result, had to be uh, uh, dealt with. But I don't know how often that kind of thing happens. So fair to say the commission's interested in the seven o'clock start. Okay, jeopardize that for next meeting. We let uh, Commissioner Skrowski that and see if she has it. She was best on the chair, but just yeah, just keep. I'm just Strafi is here. You can also like the show. It's just like hello. That's the letter's funny. Oh, I had my invisibility clue. All right. Was there anything else? Yeah, super small item. So the council has started adopt practice of not using single use water bottles. Great. And so as to say, that's good. But you know, pass that practice on the commission. Uh, so a uh, tiny item, I guess. Bring your, one. bring your, um, bring it. I'll bring my own. Bring your my suggestion. Yeah, if you want to be truly sustainable, bring yeah, your own. This will really help a lot to have a plastic yes. cup. E I know. E e yes. That's a good yeah. idea. It's a ramp process. So <laughs> we like to avoid the plastic cups. Um, so if you're okay, bring in a cup or something like that. Or keep it here. So your suggestion. We're just going to do it. That's it. For our city clerk. No VOCs. <laughs> It's, it's recycled. Here's one recycled. Someday. 
Potable, it's potable water, Commissioner. It's potable water. Potable water. Potable water. <laughs> no, you know, they, they can make potable water out of wastewater. It's just, that, you know, and they're doing it. It's just not, I mean, there's lots of water available if you do that. I don't think we have done that as this night. I know. <laughs> so, so, so we'll have cups if you need it, but please bring your own. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything? Any, any comments, questions? All right, I adjourn the meeting till uh, what's the next day? Twenty third. Thank you all. Thanks. Good luck with baby. Hopefully she's. Here.